ACC 311. Intermediate Financial Accounting. Study Session 1. Partnership Law and Accounts. Introduction to Partnership Accounts. A partnership is a relationship that exists between two or more persons carrying on a business common with a view to making a profit. Where two or more persons wish to form a partnership, then it is recommended that they agree on the terms upon which the partnership will be run and the relationship between each other. The Concept of Partnership A partnership could arise under any of the following circumstances. 1. Where two or more people decide to set up a business venture. 2. Where two people previously carrying on businesses as sole traders, amalgamate their respective firms to form a partnership. 3. Where a sole trader brings in other people to participate in his existing business as partners. The Types of Partnership The major types of the partnership include 1. General Partner A general partner is a partner who has the power to participate fully in the conduct of the partnership business. He is also liable to the full extent of his estate for the partnership debts and liabilities. 2. Limited Partner A limited partner is a partner where liability towards the firm's debt is limited to the sum of money which he has agreed to contribute as a share of capital. 3. Nominal Partner A nominal partner is a partner who does not necessarily contribute any capital to the partnership. He does however allow his name to be used as a partner in the business. Partnership Agreement or Deed A partnership agreement or deed governs the relationship between the partners. It spells out the arrangements which have been decided upon between the parties. It usually provides information in respect of the following. 1. The rights and duties of each partner. 2. The amount of capital to be contributed by each partner. 3. The ratio in which partners should share profits or losses. 4. The limit of each partner's drawings. 5. The salaries to be paid to the partners. 6. The rate of interest to be paid on the capital. 7. The rate of interest to be charged on the partner's drawings. 8. Status of each partner. 9. Basis for valuing goodwill on the death or retirement of a partner. 10. Method of determining the amount to be paid to a retiring partner. Partnership accounts. They include the following. 1. Partner's personal accounts. Once a partnership is formed, a personal account is opened for each of the partners. The value of the assets contributed to the firm by each partner, that is, his capital is credited to his personal account, while any drawings made by a partner are debited to his personal account. 2. The capital account. A partner capital account indicates the financial stake or interest that a partner has in the partnership. In most partnerships, the capital accounts are fixed thus necessitating the additional use of current accounts. 3. The fixed capital account. Most partnership agreements provide for a fixed amount of capital to be introduced by each partner. Such amount contributed will usually remain in the partnership books unaltered throughout the life of the partnership. The partner's capital accounts are therefore regarded as fixed in such a situation and would only be changed by agreement. 4. The current account. Current accounts are used by partnerships in which the capital accounts of the partners are fixed. Each partner's current account is debited with the total of his drawings for the year whether in cash or goods, as well as any interest on such drawings. 5. The Drawings Account The Drawings Account deals with goods or cash taken out of the business during the year by the partners. A separate Drawings Account may be kept for each partner to record as withdrawals throughout the year. At the end of the year, the balance on the account is transferred to the partner's current account. Accounting Entries 1. Debit Partners Capital Account 2. Credit Profit and Loss Appropriation Account The Revaluation Account. The Revaluation Account can be described as a miniature profit and loss account in which capital profits are credited and capital losses debited accordingly. The corresponding entries to these in the Revaluation Account are posted to either the debit or credit side of the respective asset accounts. Account Entries. 1. Increase on Revaluation of an Asset. Debit Appropriate Asset Account and Credit Revaluation Account. 2. Decrease on Revaluation of an Asset. Debit Revaluation Account and Credit Appropriate Asset Account. 3. Any decrease in the value of a liability. Debit Relevant Liability Account and Credit Revaluation Account. It will. Upon the admission of a new partner into a firm or on the retirement or death of a partner, or when the profit sharing ratio of the partners is to be changed, the issue of goodwill will arise. It will also arise if the partners decide to sell the partnership business. Firms that possess goodwill may not always open an account for such goodwill in their books, 
except whose it was paid for in cash or with other assets of the firm. When a firm possesses goodwill, that is unrecorded in its books, it will be understating the capital of the partners to the extent of the value of such goodwill. The goodwill possessed by a firm may have arisen from a number of different factors. Some of such factors are as follows. 1. The quality of the firm or the reputation of its service. 2. The personal reputation of the partners, such as their charisma and business acumen. 3. The possession of favorable contracts, complete or partial monopoly. 4. The location of the business premises. 5. The possession of trademarks, patent. Methods of dealing with goodwill on the admission of a new partner. There are basically three methods of dealing with goodwill when a new partner is to be admitted into a partnership firm. The treatment of goodwill in subsequently each case will depend on the terms of agreement of the admission. The three methods of dealing with goodwill are as follows. 1. Where the money paid by the new partner for his share of goodwill is not retained in the books. 2. Where the money paid by the new partner for his share of goodwill is retained in the books. 3. Where an account is raised in the books for the full value of the goodwill. Retirement or death of a partner. In the same manner that people retire from public service or other human endeavors, so also do partners retire from partnership firms. Such retirements from the partnership may be as a result of old age, infirmity, or some other reasons. Often too, a partner still in active service may die. Technically, the retirement or death of a partner culminates in the dissolution of the partnership. However, in practice, partnership firms tend to continue in business even after the retirement or death of a partner. Thus, the remaining partners will keep the business afloat. Settlement of debt due to a retired or deceased partner. Once the total amount due to a retired or deceased partner has been finally established, the firm is obliged to discharge such debt. 1. Immediate settlement. If funds are available, the debt may be settled immediately by an outright payment of cash. 2. Deferred settlement. As stated earlier, when a partner retires or dies, the remaining partner who carries on the business of the firm is expected to work out a final settlement for the debt due to the retired partner or the deceased partner's estate. Dissolution of a partnership, general principles. A partnership may be dissolved under different circumstances and for various reasons. The dissolution of a partnership implies that the entity will permanently cease to exist with the consequent termination of all its previous engagements and activities. Conditions for the dissolution of a partnership. A partnership may be dissolved under any of the following circumstances, provided there is no provision to the contrary in the partnership agreement. 1. On the expiration of the term of the partnership, if a fixed term was agreed upon. 2. On the death of a partner. 3. On the bankruptcy of a partner. 4. On the partner giving notice to the others or his intention to dissolve the firm. 5. On the occurrence of an event that makes the partnership illegal. 6. On the partner permitting his share of the partnership to be charged for his separate debt. Summary of Study Session 1. In this study session, please note the following. 2. A partnership is a relationship that subsides between two or more people carrying on a business in common with a view of making a profit. 3. There are three major types of partnership, general, limited and nominal partnership. 4. A partnership agreement or deed governs the relationship between the partners. It spells out the arrangements which have been decided upon between the parties. 5. There are several partnership accounts like, the capital account, the fixed capital account, the current account, the drawings account, etc. 6. Upon the admission of a new partner into a firm or on the retirement or death of a partner, or when the profit-sharing ratio of the partners is to be changed, the issue of goodwill will arise. Study Session 2. Detailed Treatment of Some Selected Accounting Standards Introduction Accounting standards are those set of rules that are meant to guide the activities of accounts practitioners. These rules and regulations state the dos and don'ts involved in accounting. First Time Adoption of International Financial Reporting Standards IFRS 1 IFRS 1 requires an entity that is adopting IFRS standards for the first time to prepare a complete set of financial statements covering its first IFRS reporting period in the preceding year. The company uses the same accounting policies throughout all periods presented in its first IFRS financial statements. Accounting Policies, Changes in Accounting Estimates and Errors Accounting policies are those broad guidelines consistently followed by an enterprise for the purpose of effectively presenting its financial position over a given period. They ensure consistency of decisions by limiting the area within which they are made while encouraging some amount of discretion and initiative. 
dealing with similar and related issues, and the definitions, recognition criteria, and measurement concepts for assets, liabilities, income, and expenses in the conceptual framework. Changes in an accounting policy are applied retrospectively unless this is impracticable or unless another IFRS standard sets specific transitional provisions. Changes in accounting estimates result from new information or new developments and, accordingly, are not corrections of errors. The effect of a change in an accounting estimate is recognized prospectively by including it in profit or loss in the period of the change, if the change affects that period only, or the period of the change and future periods, if the change affects both. Main factors underlying the selection and application of appropriate accounting policies. There are five main considerations that govern the selection and application by management of appropriate accounting policies in the preparation of financial statements. They are as follows. 1 prudence. 2. Substance over form. 3. Materiality. 4. Objectivity. 5. Fairness. Fundamental accounting concepts. There are some basic assumptions that underlie the preparation of financial statements of business enterprises. They are seldom disclosed since enterprises are expected to follow them strictly. Some of these fundamental accounting concepts are as follows. 1. Going concern concept. 2. Consistency concept. 3. Accrual concept. 4. Business entity concept. 5. Realization concept. Accounting bases. Accounting bases are those diverse principles that extend from fundamental accounting concepts. They have evolved over time in response to the ever changing and often complex nature of business transactions. Some of the areas where different accounting bases are recognized at present are as follows 1. Depreciation of fixed assets. 2. Treatment of intangible assets. 3. Stock and work in progress, long-term contracts. 4. Deferred taxation. 5. Higher purchase, credit sales, or leasing transactions. 6. Translation of foreign currencies. 7. Consolidation transactions. Long-term assets. Property, plant, and equipment. The following items should be disclosed. 1. Land and buildings. 2. Plant and equipment. 3. Other categories of assets, suitably identified. 4. Accumulated depreciation. Current assets. The following items should be disclosed separately. 1. Cash. 2. Receivables. 3. Inventories. Current liabilities. The following items should be disclosed separately. 1. Bank loans and overdrafts. 2. Current portions of long term liabilities. 3. Payables. IAS 16 Accounting for Property, Plant, and Equipment. This standard establishes principles for recognizing property, plant, and equipment as assets, measuring their carrying amounts, and measuring the depreciation charges and impairment losses to be recognized in relation to them. Property, plant, and equipment are tangible items that 1. Are held for use in the production or supply of goods or services, for rental to others, or for administrative purposes. 2. Are expected to be used during more than one period. Property, plant, and equipment include bearer plants related to agricultural activity. The cost of an item of property, plant, and equipment is recognized as an asset if, and only if. 1. It is probable that future economic benefits associated with the item will flow to the entity. 2. The cost of the item can be measured reliably. Components of cost. The cost of an item of property, plant, and equipment comprises its purchase price, including import duties and non-refundable purchase taxes and any directly attributable costs of bringing the asset to a working condition for its intended use. Examples of directly attributable costs are 1. Site preparation. 2. Initial delivery and handling costs. 3. Installation cost, such as special foundations for plants. 4. Professional fees. Historical cost accounting basic. Where an asset is acquired for cash, the components of such acquisition cost as at the date of acquisition should be recorded. They include 1. The cash price of the asset and 2. The import duties, development levies, consultancy fees, etc and other non-recurring levies. 3. Trade discounts and rebates should be deducted in arriving at the cash price. Where an asset is constructed, those costs that relate directly to the asset and other expenses attributable to the construction of the asset should be recorded.
Such costs would include 1. Cost of direct material 2. Cost of direct labor 3. Direct expenses and overhead costs IAS2 Inventories This statement deals with the valuation and presentation of stock in financial statements in the context of the historical cost system, which is the most widely adopted basis on which financial statements are presented. This statement does not deal with stock accumulated under long-term construction contracts or with the stock treatment of byproducts. 1. Inventories. 2. Historical cost of stock. 3. Costs of purchase. 4. Costs of conversion. 5. Net realizable value. Valuation of livestock. There are three approaches to the valuation of livestock. They are as follows. 1. Net realization value. Under this approach, the value of the livestock is based on the expected returns allowing for the costs of fattening, preparation for sale, and selling. 2. Cost approach. Under this approach, the value is based on the actual cost incurred on each category of livestock. 3. Appraised value. Under this approach, the value is determined by professional valuation, taking into consideration the current market value, the mortality factor, and the relative marketability of the bred or class of stock. Major problems associated with the valuation of livestock. 1. Determining the actual number in their existence especially animals that graze. 2. Identifying the various stages of their development. Valuation methods are acceptable under IAS 2. 1. First in, first out. 2. Average cost. 3. Specific identification. 4. Standard cost. 5. Adjusted selling price method. Valuation methods are unacceptable under IAS 2. 1. Latest purchase price. 2. Last in, last out. 3. Base stock. IAS 11 Accounting for Construction Contracts. This statement deals with accounting for construction contracts in the financial statements of contractors. For the purpose of this statement, a construction contract is a contract for the construction of an asset or of a combination of assets that together constitute a single project. The specific duration of the contract performance is not used as a distinguishing feature of a construction contract. Types of construction contracts. Although construction contracts are formulated in a variety of ways, there are basically two main types of construction contracts. These are as follows. 1. Fixed price contracts. The contractor agrees to a fixed contract price, or rate, in some cases subject to cost escalation clauses. 2. Cost plus contracts. The contractor is reimbursed for allowable or otherwise defined costs, plus a percentage of these costs or a fixed fee. Methods of accounting for construction contracts. The two main methods of accounting for construction contracts are as follows. 1. The percentage of completion method. 2. The completed contract method. ES21 The effects of changes in foreign exchange rates. An entity may carry on foreign activities in two ways. It may have transactions in foreign currencies or it may have foreign operations. ES21 prescribes how an entity should. 1. Account for foreign currency transactions. 2. Translate financial statements of a foreign operation into the entity's functional currency. 3. Translate the entity's financial statements into a presentation currency, if different from the entity's functional currency. Accounting for foreign currency transactions. A transaction in a foreign currency is recorded in the financial records of an entity as of the date on which the transaction occurs, normally using the exchange rate on that date. For practical reasons, it is common to use a rate that approximates the actual rate. Transaction of the financial statements of foreign operations. Various methods are currently in use for translating the financial statements of foreign operations. A number of methods apply different exchange rates to different assets and liabilities. Among these is the method that translates monetary items at the closing rate but other items at the rates in effect when the amounts of the relevant items were determined. EOS 19 Employees Benefits Employee benefits are all forms of consideration given by an entity in exchange for service rendered by employees or for the termination of employment. EOS 19 requires an entity to recognize 1. A liability when an employee has provided service in exchange for employee benefits to be paid in the future. 2. An expense when the entity consumes the economic benefit arising from the service provided by an employee in exchange for employee benefits. Allocation problems. 
As a result of the many factors that frequently enter into the computation of retirement benefits under defined benefits plans and the length of time over which the benefits are earned, allocation problems arise in determining how the costs of the retirement benefits should be recognized in the financial statements of the employer. Distinction between accounting and funding objectives. When there is a separate retirement benefits fund the position is sometimes taken that the amounts paid by an employer to the fund during an accounting period provide an appropriate charge to income. The objective of the funding is to make available amounts to meet future obligations for the payment of retirement benefits. Funding is a financing procedure and, in determining the periodic amount to be funded, the employer may be influenced by such factors as the availability of money and tax consideration. The objective of accounting for the cost of a retirement benefit plan is to ensure that the cost of the benefit is allocated to the accounting period so a systematic basis related to the receipt of the employee's services. Vested Benefits The situations where benefit rights have been awarded retrospectively, and the total assets set aside to meet the obligations of a plan fall short of the actuarially determined value of vested benefits under the plan, then either of the following accounting treatments may apply. 1. The shortfall may be charged to income in the period in which it arises or, alternatively, the deficiency may record both as a liability and a deferred charge and charged against income as funding payments are made to eliminate the deficiency. 2. The shortfall may represent a contingency, which should be disclosed in a note. 3. Provided the plan continues, the shortfall may be made up in future years and therefore, under the going concern assumption, the information would be irrelevant. IFRS 7 Financial Instruments, Disclosures. This standard requires entities to provide disclosures in their financial statements that enable users to evaluate. 1. The significance of financial instruments for the entity's financial position and performance. 2. The nature and extent of risks arising from financial instruments to which the entity is exposed during the period and at the end of the reporting period, and how the entity manages those risks. IFRS 7 applies to all entities, including entities that have few financial instruments, for example, a manufacturer whose only financial instruments are cash, accounts receivable, and accounts payable and those that have many financial instruments, for example, a financial institution most of whose assets and liabilities are financial instruments. 1 AS 17 Accounting for Leases. This statement deals with accounting for leases. It does not deal with the following specialized types of leases. 1. Lease agreements to explore for or use natural resources such as oil, gas, timber, metals, and other mineral rights. 2. Licensing agreements for such terms as motion picture films, video recordings, plays, manuscripts, patents, and copyrights. Classification of leases the classification of leases adoption in this standard is based on the extent to which risks and rewards incident to ownership of a leased asset lie with the lesser or the lessee. Risks include the possibility of losses from idle capacity or technological obsolescence and of variations in return due to changing economic conditions. Leases are usually classified according to the substance of the transaction rather than the form of the contract. Thus, a lease would be classified as a finance lease if it transferred substantially all the risks and rewards incident to ownership. Finance leases are usually non-cancellable and secure for the lesser the recovery of the capacity outlay plus a return for the funds invested. A lease would be classified as an operating lease if substantially all the risks and rewards incident to ownership is not transferred. 1 is 12 Accounting for Income Taxes. This standard prescribes the accounting treatment for income taxes. Income taxes include all domestic and foreign taxes that are based on taxable profits. Current tax for current and prior periods is to the extent that it is unpaid is recognized as a liability, while overpayment of current tax is recognized as an asset. Current tax liabilities for the current and prior periods are measured at the amount expected to be paid to the taxation authorities, using the tax rates that have been enacted or substantively enacted by the end of the reporting period. Originating Timing Differences These are timing differences that occur when the profits assessable to tax are less than the profits reported in the accounts in any given year. They can be classified into short-term and long-term timing differences. Reversing timing differences. These are timing differences that occur in subsequent years when the profits assessable to tax are greater than the profits reported for the year in the financial statements. Methods of providing for deferred taxes. EAS 12 requires that companies should provide for deferred taxation on timing differences either according to the deferral or liability method. EAS 40 Investment Properties. 
An investment property is an investment in land or buildings held primarily for generating income or capital appreciation and not occupied substantially for use, or in the operations of, the investing enterprise or another enterprise in the same group as the investing enterprise. Examples of investment property. 1. Land held for long-term capital appreciation. 2. Land held for a currently undetermined future use. 3. Building leased out under an operating lease. 4. Vacant buildings held to be leased out under an operating lease property that is being constructed or developed for future use as an investment property. The following are not an investment property. 1. Property held for use in the production or supply of goods or services or for administrative purposes. 2. Property held for sale in the ordinary course of business or in the process of construction of development for such sale. 3. Property being constructed or developed on behalf of third parties. 4. Property lease to another entity under a finance lease. Disclosures. A reporting enterprise should state, in the appropriate section of its financial statements, its accounting policies with respect to investments. A reporting enterprise should disclose in its financial statements, significant amounts included in income in respect of. 1. Interest, dividends, and rentals on short-term investments, long-term investments, and investment properties. 2. Profits and losses on disposal of short-term investments. 3. Profits and losses on disposal of long-term investments. 4. The amount by which aggregate cost exceeds market value, the net unrealized loss. Summary of Study Session 2 In this study session, please note the following. 1. There are many accounting standards such as 1. IFRS 1 First-Time Adoption of International Financial Reporting Standards 2. IAS 8 Accounting Policies Changes in accounting estimates and errors. 3. IAS 1 Information to be disclosed in financial statements. 4. IAS 40 Investment Properties. 5. IAS 16 Accounting for Property, Plant, and Equipment. 6. IAS 12 Accounting for Income Tax. 2. There are some basic assumptions which underlie the preparation of financial statements of business enterprises known as fundamental accounting concepts and they include. 1. Going concern concept. 2. Consistency concept. 3. Accrual concept. 4. Business entity concept. 5. Realization concept. 3. Accounting bases are those diverse principles that extend from fundamental accounting concepts. They have evolved over time in response to the ever-changing and often complex nature of business transactions.